welcome to Lagos Baptist Church on this Lord's Day. We think over the last almost 11 years as a church family, this is unique as a Lord's Day. It's the first time that we have not had the um, privilege and blessing of gathering to worship uh, together. Uh, we're gathering uh, by way of technology today, and I'm grateful for the means to be able to do that. Let me share with you some announcements. Uh, we're working hard to try to communicate clearly. The church office is open as uh, per our normal hours, so you can reach us as needed. Uh, but you should have uh, access. You'll find there on our, either in your email and on the website, you'll find a bulletin today to update you on a couple things. And uh, we would uh, just want you to be reminded that for our Wednesday night Bible study and prayer time and for our Sunday morning worship, you should be able to find uh, both of those posted on Wednesday night and on Sunday. Uh, the YouTube it, channel will be our primary means of posting because that is available to folks whether they have Facebook or not. But we'll, So we'll post all of those services on the YouTube channel, on uh, Facebook, and obviously on the church website. In addition, on the church website, you will be able to find uh, instructions and in today's bulletin on how you can continue to give faithfully. Obviously, we still are trying to live out the budget that we've committed to, so uh, a means for you to find instructions there how you can continue on with your tithes and offerings during this season when we're not able to meet uh, together. And you can do that a couple of ways. Let me just remind you of that. You can bring your tithes and offerings by the church office during normal office hours, text giving. You've got that number available in the bulletin. And also you can give through either debit checking or savings accounts, and uh, you'll find those instructions uh, in, the, in the bulletin. And if you have any questions, just get in touch with Ms. Julianne, our financial secretary, and she can help you with that. I've thought much about over recent weeks about the, how we um, even think of our corporate gatherings as we think about worshiping together as the body of Christ. And we try to live by the regulative principle. And if you think about the regulative principle, what, what do we see in Scripture in terms of instructions and what are elements of our worshiping together? Well, know that we're not together. We are the church. And so the church is not a building. We are the church but when we gather corporately, the elements of worship that we look for and see in Scripture as normative would be preaching of the Word, reading of God's Word, singing hymns and spiritual songs, praying and giving of our tithes and offerings. So I'm grateful for um, Stephen's giftedness and expertise to enable us to uh, record and send out services, and we're going to try to hit on as many of these uh, elements of the regulative of, uh, principle as we can, and how we long for the day when we can, hopefully that's sooner rather than later, but we can gather back together, and I assure you will appreciate it in um, ways that we probably didn't fully appreciate it before. As we worship this morning, I want to look at the first three verses of Psalm 80 as we turn our focus to the Lord. The psalmist writes, O give ear, shepherd of Israel. You who lead Joseph like a flock. You who are enthroned above the cherubim shine forth. Before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up your power and come to save us. What a prayer. What a reality. What good biblical truth and theology we have here. Verse 3. O oh God. Restore us and cause your face to shine upon us, and we will be saved. Amen. What an encouraging word as we worship this morning. And I want to reference the prayer guide. We um, spent some time on this this past Wednesday night. We'll come back to that next Wednesday night, this coming week. Uh, but it's up to 17 ways we can pray. But in uncertain times, it is uh, such an encouragement to our hearts to know that um, none of this is taken uh, God by surprise. He indeed reigns upon his throne. He indeed is the great shepherd of Israel. He is enthroned above the cherubim. So let us pray as we worship this morning. Heavenly Father, we worship and praise you. God, we are so grateful that you are God. Lord, you rule, you reign, you live, you are holy, you are uncaused, you're eternal, you're sovereign over all things, nothing, nothing takes you by surprise, nothing threatens, challenges you, we rest in that, 
Heavenly Father, this is a unique time and season for us as we are walking through circumstances unlike uh, circumstances that we have experienced, many of us in our entire lifetime and certainly not in recent days. And so, God, we are so grateful to be able to come aside as a church family, as the body of Christ, uh, to be able to worship Father, it is our prayer and our heart's desire that our worship would be acceptable in your sight, even this Lord's Day uh, gathering in a different manner reminds us that we worship ultimately for an audience of one. We thank you for every Lagos member, God. We pray that you would, during this time, in even a greater way, you would knit us together in love as we are separated by space, uh, even as we should be and have to be, God, would you draw us close to you? Would you draw us close to each other? We pray that you would be glorified in our worship today. Father, we pray that our singing, our reading of your word, the prayers that are prayed, the giving of tithes and offerings, the preaching of your word would Uh, Be a sweet aroma, Father, in your sight. Would exalt Christ. We thank you even for the means that you've given us to be able to continue on. We uh, thank you for the guests you have blessed us with, those um, maybe even tuning in this day, God, that, um, that your word would go forth with your blessing and your power, and we are reminded that it will not return void without accomplishing the purpose for which you have uh, sent it forth. We love you, we praise you, we worship you this day. In Jesus' name, amen. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand.
scripture reading is from Psalm 46. What a, what a great promise that we have here from, from God's word. Psalm 46, the whole chapter we'll read together. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the sea, Though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. 
Come, behold, the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolation on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Let's pray. Father, what a a great word this morning that you are with us. You are our refuge, our strength. And Lord, we stop this morning and we are still to know and remind ourselves that you are God. God, at your very word, the earth melts and yet you can stop wars. God, you have all power. Lord, there is none like you. We remind ourselves this morning that we, uh, Lord, we are but dust, but we are in the palm of your hand. And so, Lord, we thank you, God, for your power. We thank you for the comfort and peace that is found only in Christ. Lord, we rest this morning in who you are. Not in our situation, not in um, how volatile the circumstances are around us. Lord, we rest in you and in you alone. Father, I pray that these next few moments, God, would be um, God, just a reminder of, of your goodness, your grace. And Lord, that you would open our hearts to receive your truth. God, that you would do a work in us that only you can do. And we will be careful to give you all glory and praise. Would you bless this time now? In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. How apt God's word is. And um, every circumstance we walk through, it's amazing how when we read scripture, we find God has covered that. His word is indeed sufficient and a great blessing. If you have a copy of God's word Uh, This morning, I ask you to turn to the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel. If you're part of our Lagos family for the last months, uh, several months, couple months, I should say, we have been working through 1 Samuel last week for our church family, and you can look back if you missed that, but we just finished up 1 Samuel 14 where we saw King Saul making all kind of both foolish and futile attempts to do religious things with the idea that that would gain him God's favor. And he did those devoid of true heart devotion to God, love for God, and a personal relationship with the Lord. So we come to 1 Samuel 15. This will be a two-part message for us as there's a lot in this chapter, in these 35 verses. I'll read the entire chapter. The sermon title, To Obey, is better than sacrifice. To obey is better than sacrifice. And it is a heavy, it's a heavy chapter. It's, um, it confronts us. Uh, We're confronted in this chapter with God's wrath and um, even God, as we'll consider, regretting. What does that mean when God regrets? Regretting having made Saul king. So a major transition in the book. I'll read the chapter and we'll unpack uh, down through verse 23 uh, today. The word of the Lord from 1 Samuel 15. Then Samuel said to Saul, the Lord has sent me to anoint you, or I should say the Lord sent me to anoint you as king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek For what he did to Israel, how he set himself against him on the way while he was coming up from Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and utterly destroy all that he has. And do not spare him, but put to death both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Then Saul summoned the people and numbered them in Tel Aim, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men of Judah. Saul came to the city of Amalek and set an ambush in the valley. Saul said to the Kenites, Go, depart. 
Go down from among the Malachites so that I do not destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the sons of Israel when they came up from Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. So Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as you go to Shur, which is east of Egypt. He captured Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were not willing to destroy them utterly, but everything despised and worthless, that they utterly destroyed. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not carried out my commands. And Samuel was distressed and cried out to the Lord all night. Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, and it was told Samuel saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself, then turned and proceeded on down to Gilgal. Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have carried out the command of the Lord. But Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, but the rest we have utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said to Saul, Wait, and let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said to him, Speak. Samuel said, Is it not true? Though you were little in your own eyes, you were made the head of the tribes of Israel. And the Lord anointed you king over Israel. And the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are exterminated. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord, but rushed upon the spoil and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord? Then Samuel said, excuse me, then Saul said to Samuel, I did obey the voice of the Lord and went on the mission on which the Lord sent me and have brought back Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took some of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the choicest of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God at Gilgal. Samuel said, Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination and insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I have indeed transgressed the command of the Lord in your words because I feared the people and listened to their voice. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you for you have rejected the word of the Lord and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. As Samuel turned to go, Saul seized the edge of his robe, and it tore. So Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to your neighbor who is better than you. Also, the glory of Israel will not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. Then he said, I have sinned, but please honor me now before the elders of my people and before Israel and go back with me that I may worship the Lord your God. So Samuel went back following Saul and Saul worshiped the Lord. Then Samuel said, bring me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came to him cheerfully. And Agag said, surely the bitterness of death is past. But Samuel said, as your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hewed Agag to pieces before the Lord at Gilgal. Then Samuel went to Ramah, but Saul went up to his house at Gibeah of Saul. Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death, for Samuel grieved over Saul. And the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. The word of the Lord, let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. God, we um, are humbled by it as we see your um, 
your glory, your holiness. Lord, as we see our sin and the seriousness of our sin, Holy Spirit, we pray that you will guide us into truth, that we will fear you, God, that we will know you, that we will exalt Christ. We pray that you would empower us to do all that you instruct us to do this day for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Chapter 15, 1 Samuel, to obey is better than sacrifice. Again, a major transition in the book there in verse 1. We see Samuel back on the scene, and we have not seen him in quite a while in the account. And obviously, even if we think back to the start of the book where we read about Hannah longing for uh, Samuel, and he's um, obviously very late in life here. And really, it's an account. This chapter gives us an account of Saul's great sin. We'll unpack that and It's the detailed recording in Scripture of Saul's rejection by Yahweh as king. So King Saul is rejected by the true king of Israel, by Yahweh. And if I had to say the main takeaway, the main truth that we see in the chapter, and if we really had to press it down, I would say we see clearly the priority of obedience. The priority of obedience And you see in two places here the clear instruction. God gave Saul a mission. If you look there with me at verse 18, the Lord sent you on a mission. Verse 20, Saul said to Samuel, I did obey the voice of the Lord and went on the mission. God gave a clear directive. It's a hard directive. We'll talk about that. And the priority was for Saul to obey God as the priority always is for us. And we we worship God by obeying God. We love God by obeying God. And that clear instruction that we get multiple ways to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of ram. So we'll ponder as we go this overarching umbrella of the priority of obedience. To obey is better than than sacrifice. I want to break this into four perspectives through these first 23 verses this morning. First of all, number one, a clear mission given. A clear mission given. And it's a it's a, a mission that challenges our understanding of who God is, our understanding of who we are. Look there at verse 1 again with me. Samuel, again, he's re-entered the scene, said to Saul, and here's the message. So Samuel's God's prophet, and the prophet brings God's word to God's people, in this instance, to God's king. Samuel said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you as king over his people, over Israel. Now, therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. So we've got here this clear mission. It's very explicit that the word is not a word from Samuel. It's a word from God. Listen to the words of the Lord. We drop down to verse 10, then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. So Samuel is speaking God's word, and here's the message. It's a message, by the way. I want you to picture um, the, the divine courtroom, the judicial bar, the accountability of the Amalekite standing before God's justice bar. Verse 2, thus says the Lord of hosts. Here's his sentence handed down. I will punish... Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he set himself against him on the way while he was coming up from Egypt. Now here's the directive, here's the judicial sentence, verse 3. Now go and strike Amalek and utterly destroy all that he has and do not spare him, but put to death both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. What a heavy message of divine judgment. This sentence from God to be carried out. And it's a sentence from God against the Amalekites, a nomadic people that lived south of Israel in the Sinai Desert. And think of it this way. The sins, uh, 300 years earlier, the sins of the Amalekites, and they'd been filling up all this time. And at this point, they're filled up, and God's wrath is going to be poured out on the Amalekites We go back to Exodus to get some instruction to what's being referenced here in God's word. 
when he says he's going to punish Amalek for what he did to Israel. What did Amalek do to Israel? Where, well, in Exodus, we see that. Exodus 17, verse 8. Then Amalek came and fought against Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, choose men for us and go out, fight against Amalek. Tomorrow I will station myself on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. Joshua did as Moses told him and fought against Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. So it came about when Moses held his hand up that Israel prevailed. And when he let his hand down, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. And they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other. Thus his hands were steady until the sun Set. So Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Listen to verse 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this in a book as a memorial, as a memorial and recite it to Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and named it, The Lord is my banner. And he said, The Lord has sworn the Lord will have war against Amalek from generation to generation. And here we are 300 years later and we see that sentence being carried out. We further read in Deuteronomy 25, verse 17, Remember, God says, remember what Amalek did to you along the way when you came out of Egypt, how he met you along the way and attacked among you all the stragglers at your rear when you were faint and weary and he did not fear God. Therefore, it shall come about when the Lord your God has given you rest from all your surrounding enemies in the land which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance to possess. You shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. You must not forget. And so the mission that God has given King Saul is to go and blot out Amalek. It's 300 years later and this terrifying account that shows us the seriousness of sin, the seriousness of sin in this time and the seriousness of sin in our time. I like what Alistair Begg said about this. What we have here in this account is not an ethnic cleansing, not an ethnic cleansing, but an ethical cleansing. It's God's wrath being poured out. This will certainly fly in the face of our tendency in our day and in our culture and our society to elevate man, that man is supreme. We see God's wrath. And before we question or challenge God, it's clear that the Amalekites 300 years ago were guilty, and it's clear that the Amalekites in Samuel and Saul's day were guilty. Look back at 1 Samuel 15, verse 18. Part of the mission references this. And the Lord, Yahweh, sent you on a mission, to go on this mission, and said, go and utterly destroy, look what Scripture says, destroy the sinners. Mark this, if sinners, apart from Christ, if sinners meet the living God apart from Christ, they will meet him in his wrath. Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are exterminated. That is the mission. Verse 33, as Samuel speaks, we'll get to that next week, as Samuel speaks regarding Agag, but Samuel said to Agag, as your sword has made women childless. So we see that the Malachites had been, had set themselves against God all the way back in Moses' day and up to the present day, and God now was going to judge them. These first three verses give us a stark picture of the holy, just wrath of God being directed toward sinners and this execution of God's sentence that they would be exterminated. And by the way, it's not that they would rage and even God's instruction that there would be no plunder taken. It is a sentence handed down from Yahweh to be carried out upon these sinners. By the way, let's be clear, we are not called to wage war This way today, our battle is not, as Scripture says, against flesh and blood. It is spiritual. And therefore we, by the way, Christ will have the inheritance for which he died. All the nations, the ethnos of the world, but we don't go and wage wars like this today. But it is a clear picture. Mark this to me and to you. It's a clear picture of how God will deal with his enemies 
those who have not trusted in Christ for salvation, a clear mission given, a hard, humbling mission giving, given. Number two, a mission partially obeyed. A mission partially obeyed. Well, the instruction God gave, we pick back up at verse 4. Then Saul, he acts, he gets to work. Saul summoned the people, numbered them in Tel Aim, 200,000 foot soldiers, 10,000 men of Judah. Saul came to the city of Amalek, so he, he's carrying it out, at least to this point. Saul shows kindness to the Kenites. Look at verse 6, go, depart, go down from among the Malachites so that I do not destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the sons of Israel when they came up from Egypt. So the Kenites, they got out of town. They got out of Dodge. They departed from among the Malachites before Israel, Saul, and his army move in to destroy them. So far, so good, we would say. Verse 7. So Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as you go to Shur, which is east of Egypt. He captured Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive. And utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. We need to have a picture, a realistic picture of what's happening as we talk about God's holiness. As we talk about the seriousness of sin. There at verse 3 we read the account that the mission is to go and utterly destroy Amalek. And all that he has do not spare him. Put to death both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. But verse 8 tells us that Saul captured Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive. But he did destroy all the other people, the people with the edge of the sword. Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the ox and the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good. So they go through there and they practice, I would say, partial obedience, selective obedience. And this is a, this account. This I want you to think about this. The account of the great rejection of Saul as king of Israel is going to come about because Saul, in his eyes, partially obeyed God. And God's diagnosis, as we'll see a little bit later, is that he disobeyed him. Those haunting words of verse 9. But Saul and the people spared. See, God had said not to spare, and they spared Agag, and they spared the best of. That's interesting to me. They go through and they're... Selective. I like what um, Blakey, back from 1800, said about this in his commentary. Gives us pause, makes us think that God will execute wrath on the impenitent and unbelieving is just as much a feature of the gospel as that he will bestow all the blessings of salvation and eternal life on them that believe. See, this has... In our day, in many places, this has fallen out of an understanding of being part of the gospel, that God will execute wrath. We proclaim the good news of Jesus, and that over and against the reality of the sinfulness of man, God will indeed execute wrath on the impenitent and unbelieving, and that is part and parcel of the gospel. He goes on to say, it is most wholesome for us all to look at times steadily in the face of this solemn attribute of God. And what you see, this is not God having a temper tantrum. You know, I picture the two-year-old or three-year-old. We've all been there with our kids. The two- or three-year-old having just a temper tantrum on the floor. And that is not what we have here. This is God's solemn attribute, his perfect justice as the avenger of the impenitent. For it shows us that sin is not a thing to be trifled with. We want to take sin lightly. God never does. Sin is not a thing to be trifled with. It also shows us that God's will is not a thing to be despised. So we've got the clear mission given. We've got a mission that Saul would say partially disobeyed. And let's third look at the divine assessment. What does God say about this mission there at verse 10 is made clear again then the word of Yahweh it's not the word of Samuel it's the word of Yahweh then the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying and this is amazing scripture this whole chapter challenges us in so many ways that are healthy and good for our soul health let's what God said there in verse 11 I regret that I have made Saul king God says I regret that I have made Saul king for he has turned back from following me and listen to this 
Here's the diagnosis. He's turned back from following me and has not carried out my command. So he's calling Saul to account for his failure to obey God's commands. God regrets making Samuel king. Look down at verse 35. End of the chapter, we get that as a really a summary of the chapter. Saul, Samuel did not see Saul again. Verse 35, Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death, for Samuel grieved over Saul. By the way, Samuel's grieving. God is grieving. The Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. So what does it mean that God regrets? Some translation repents 29 times, 29 times in God's word. Scripture speaks this way about God either regretting or repenting over some aspect of man's sinfulness. Or I think back to Genesis 6, 6, the Lord was sorry What does that mean? The Lord regretted he was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. So God can be grieved in his heart. What does it mean? Well, first of all, it is not repenting and regretting at all the way man repents and regrets. I like what this commentator said. Nonchalance is never listed as an attribute of the true God. Verse 11 does not intend to suggest Yahweh's fickleness of purpose. Listen to this, but his sorrow... God, Yahweh, is indeed sorrowful over our sin. He's sorrowful over Saul's sin. It depicts Yahweh, it does not, I should say, depict Yahweh flustered over lack of foresight, but Yahweh grieved over lack of obedience. So God knows, God is sovereign. This did not take him by surprise. It's not that he didn't see that coming, but he is indeed grieved over King Saul's lack of obedience. So I want you to think about this. God says, I regret that I have made Saul king. Why is that? For he has turned back from following me and has not carried out my commands. God bemoans, regrets Saul's sin. I pause and ponder that, how to even communicate that Effectively, God truly regrets. He regrets in a holy, just, beautiful, merciful way. What does it not mean, by the way? Verse 29, we'll get to that next week in detail, but let me just show you what it doesn't mean. Even in this chapter, we get really good instruction on what's not meant. Also, verse 29, the glory of Israel will not lie or change his mind. It's not like God didn't see events coming and now that events have occurred, he's thinking differently. No, no, no. That's not how the glory of Israel, that's not who he is. The glory of Israel will not lie or change his mind for he is not a man that he should change his mind. So his regret is unlike man's regret. His repentance is unlike man's repentance. But he truly regrets and Even, by the way, that regret leads us to the gospel. We'll pick up that theme a little bit later of how sorrowful God indeed was and is over sin. Look to Jesus if you want to see that fully played out. The divine assessment of the mission and the summary point I'll make for verse 3 is heavy. I want you to listen to this. In God's sight... In God's sight, partial obedience is disobedience. To partially obey God is to disobey God. Look back at verse 11. You see God's regret. I regret, God says. Yahweh says. Let that fall on us. Help us hear that this morning. Sin is serious. I regret because of Saul's sin. I regret that I have made him king. Look at how this affected God's prophet Samuel. In the verse 11, Samuel was distressed. He didn't sleep that night. He cried out to the Lord all night. He's disturbed. God is disturbed. In God's sight, partial obedience is indeed disobedience. Fourth and finally, we need to understand this morning, understanding the gravity of partial obedience. Understanding the gravity of partial obedience. Look at verse 12. Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul. I like what... Uh, One preacher said about this, Samuel rising early in the morning to meet Saul. If you're wired like I am, if there's a really, really hard task to do, we want to go ahead and do that first thing, right? Almost get it over with. It's this hard conversation and 
Indeed, there was a hard conversation that was about to be had. Samuel rose early in the morning to go and meet Saul. And it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel. And by the way, this is one of those points in Scripture. I'm going to say, you're going to find this hard to believe. But as much as we've studied Saul, maybe not. Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself, then turned and proceeded on down to Gilgal. So you did read that, right? I want you to picture how clear Saul's sin is to God, how clear Saul's sin is to Samuel, and how blind Saul is to his own sin. What a reality that we are so often so deceived and so blind to our sin. We just don't see it. And it's almost in some sad way humorous that God has now rejected Saul as king. And Saul, what does this even look like? Behold, he set up a monument for himself. So he's so proud of himself that he, you know, he's, he's instructing the soldiers. Hey, guys, you know, let's do this carving. Now let's set that up. And here's what I want the plaque to say. And he's out there just celebrating himself. Look at his confidence in verse 13. Samuel comes to Saul. Samuel came to Saul and Saul said to him, look at this greeting. He's oblivious to what he has done. Blessed are you of the Lord. I have carried out the command of the Lord. Saul's confidence, he testifies, hey, I have done what God told. uh, I've done all the things that God's told me to do. And what a quick comeback and a piercing question that Samuel asked, verse 14. But Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? So this condemning question, what do I hear? If, in fact, you are to utterly destroy Amalek and all that he has and do not spare him, but put to death both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey, why do I hear the bleeding of all these sheep and the lowing of all these oxen? We almost know what's probably going to happen next. We do tend to be blind in regards to our sin, and we tend, when we're called to account, to blame others for our sin. Look at verse 15. Saul said, they have brought them, right? I didn't do this. They have brought them from the Amalekites for the people. I didn't do this, Samuel, God. The people spared the best of the sheep and oxen to sacrifice to the Lord. And by the way, even look at how Saul is referring to Yahweh at this point three times in this chapter. To sacrifice to the Lord, not his God, not the Lord my God, but the people are the ones to blame. They spared the best of the sheep to sacrifice them to the Lord your God. Mark this, at this point in time, God is not claiming Saul, and Saul is not claiming God. But the rest we have utterly destroyed. We do tend to blame others for our sin and try to cover up our sin. Verse 16, Samuel said to Saul, Wait, and let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Right, God's word. God's word is primary. It is what is the final word. Here's what God said. Saul says, Speak. Verse 17, Samuel said, is it not true? Here's here's your testimony, Saul. Is it not true that you were little in your own eyes by God's grace and his good pleasure and his mercy? You were made the head of the tribes of Israel and the Lord anointed you king over Israel and the Lord sent you on a mission and here were the instructions, the directives, the commandments for that mission go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are exterminated. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord but rushed upon the spoil and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord? Isn't it amazing God's diagnosis of what Saul would take lightly, how heavy you did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Saul still doesn't see it. Look at verse 20. He says to Samuel, I did obey the voice of the Lord. I went on the mission on which the Lord sent me. And look, I have brought back Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But, here he is explaining again, 
But the people, again, he's not guilty. He's not repentant before the Lord. He's not broken and contrite over his sin. But the people took some of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the choicest of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice, by the way, to the Lord again, your God, not to God, my God, our God, but the Lord, your God, at Gilgal. Verse 22, and there's such a, a theology of knowing, loving, following God, being disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a rich theology in these two verses and in the context leading up to this. Samuel said, I want you to think about this. It makes complete sense. The Bible always does has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Think about that. I think about our tithes and offerings. We, so people sometimes think, well, God wants our money. I want to tell you, God owns everything. He, indeed's own, own, he indeed owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He is the creator and sustainer of all that is. Do you think God really gets excited about burnt offerings and sacrifices? Is that something he needs? Or is he rather looking for hearts that are devoted to him as in obeying the voice of the Lord. And then our sermon title, this scripture we need to ponder much and deeply and for many, many days. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. I think about our culture's discussion of um, the sanctity, the sacredness of human life, our culture's discussion of marriage, our culture's discussion of human sexuality. At the end of the day, is God looking for us to give great offerings? No, God, that flows, by the way, from hearts devoted to him. We'll, when we know him and love him, it'll be easy to give back to him the time and talents and money, the things he's given us. What God is looking for, true love for the Lord, devotion to the Lord, is evidenced by Obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, to heed than the fat of rams. I picture Hophni and Phinehas bringing those, taking those offerings from the Lord. It revealed where their hearts were. And look, at, it goes on, it gets, he cuts deeper. Verse 23, for rebellion, when we rebel against, we disobey God's word, rebellion is like the sin of divination. You might as well set up a false god and worship this false god. And insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry. We'd be setting up false gods. It's as serious to disobey God as it is to do that because you have rejected the word of the Lord. What a sad, sad indictment. He has also rejected you from being king. Let's apply this. I feel like we're stopping in the middle of the sermon. We'll pick back up at verse 24 to next, uh, next time we're together, next Lord's Day, Lord willing. But application, what do we do with this? Certainly a passage of scripture that calls us to confront a number of truths and doctrines and realities that um, in our human flesh we probably don't want to confront, but which are good for us. First of all, allow the reality of the wrath of God to humble us before him and encourage us to treasure Jesus. Allow the reality of the wrath of God to humble us before him and encourage us to treasure Jesus' sin is so serious. God is indeed the God who is just. By the way, I think we normally speak to, we are able to see the folks and most of the folks in the room on a given Lord's Day. I don't know who's tuning in or where you might be this morning. But I want to tell you, the gospel is clear. The gospel is clear. God is holy. We are not. And because of our sin... We have committed capital crimes against the holy living God. And because of that, we will be called to account for our sins. But God intervened. God so regretted our sin that he sent his son, the son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come to earth and to be tempted in all the same ways that we're tempted as sinners. We are tempted in sin. But Christ was tempted in all those same ways, but he never sinned. See, and Christ then is the perfect sacrifice. So his obedience, his righteousness, God is pleased to credit over to us. And Christ went to Calvary's cross and he laid down his life. He was nailed to the cross and he poured out his blood as a sacrifice for sin. And God is pleased to look at Christ's perfect life and credit that as 
to give us now a perfect life, our righteousness. And God is pleased to take our sin and place them on Christ. And the way we receive this gospel as we turn from our sins and we trust in, we believe in Jesus, we throw ourselves upon him, not some work we can do, some gift we can give, or some place we can attain. We trust in, by God's grace, we trust in Jesus' blood. His life, our life, his death, payment for our sins. God raised him from the dead. And those of us that believe in, trust in, depend on Jesus, are saved and therefore We will not experience God's wrath, but we preach the whole gospel. Allow the reality of the wrath of God. I would say for believers this morning, it should humble us before him and encourage us to treasure Jesus. For unbelievers, I would say run to Jesus, cling to Jesus, trust in Jesus, and be saved to be spared from the wrath of God. Second, see that God so regretted over sin that he would send his own son to be the sin bearer. That should calls us to exalt Jesus always, every day. See that God so regretted. What in the world? God really regrets. Yes, he regretted and he regrets the pain and hurt and consequences of sin. And that leads us to Jesus and leads us to the cross. Third, assess the degree we have thought that partial obedience is acceptable. Yeah, we're like Saul. Yeah, I I, I really did what you said there. I I obeyed. Yeah, I'm I'm encouraged in my partial obedience. No, assess the degree. We have thought in our minds, we've we've tried to tone down Scripture. We've thought that partial obedience is acceptable. It is not. And for all of us, fourth and finally, this morning, be certain that you know that you are trusting in Christ alone for salvation. There's an aspect of this. I would say that this chapter presents... Certainly truth, but the terrible reality. God's wrath is terrifying, it is holy, and it is just. And we encounter that in his dealings with the Amalekites. And I believe that's written. These things are written as an example to those who believe. So we'll read this account thousands of miles removed, thousands of years ago, of God's wrath being poured out on the Amalekites that will exhort us, encourage us to be all the more certain that we are indeed and that we are indeed in Christ, that we are trusting in Christ alone for our salvation. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for your attributes that we see uh, on display in 1 Samuel 15. God, we praise you that you are indeed holy. You are just, God. You, we long for justice, Lord. We, but oftentimes do that through the lens of seeing ourselves better than we are and seeing the sin in others. Heavenly Father, forgive us for having taken you lightly and even being, Lord, we're more like Saul than we're unlike Saul. Saul, in elevating even partial obedience and thinking that's acceptable. God, forgive us for trying to tone down your word, trying to diminish what you have said. Help us to have hearts of obedience, God, that we would be like the Bereans. We'll read your word, study your word, eagerly receive it and act upon it. I pray that you would apply these truths to Our hearts today, that as your church, we will take seriously, God, the mandate to be people that live in accordance with your word, that we will be bold to proclaim the good news of Jesus. Thank you that you have made a way for us to escape the wrath of God that will be poured out. Help us to get that message out. That Indeed, the gospel is only good news if it gets there in time, so God, help us to be zealous to proclaim this good news thank you for Christ, thank you for Christ's bride, universal thank you for Christ's bride at Lagos thank you for your faithfulness even in these days, we pray that as we are not able to gather and meet, God that you would give even a greater grace show us how to bear burdens show us how to love you 
show us how to love each other and we pray that you would even build up your church and we would come out the other side of whatever this season and trial presents to be a more holy, more healthy people and church for your glory. We praise you and ask you to work now in Jesus' name. Amen.